So previously on HPLC, we talked about this whole concept of separating things based on their activities. You know, some things are very similar, but they're all different in some way. So if we can pick out their differences, we can play off of that and we can begin separating things from each other, which is what this term chromatography really means, separation. But it translates into color writing. Okay, so with this concept, we talked about bees and wasp separating from each other in a tunnel, but the tunnel has to have something special on the inside. And for us, this was just flowers that we maybe planted and growed. But in the laboratory, it's a little bit different. So what really happened in the laboratory that created this whole concept of chromatography? Well, we're going to have a person by the name of Mikhail Tisviet that was working with plants. And Tisviet actually wanted to extract chlorophyll from the plants that he was gathering. He was a botanist. He was not a chemist. And he wanted to do studies on chlorophyll. So Tisviet was given a major problem. And the problem was this. Here's a plant. How do you get chlorophyll out of it? Oh, this was a very hard task to accomplish. That means that with that plant, you have to get rid of everything, everything, except for one molecule known as chlorophyll and capture the chlorophyll that's inside of that sample. What? How on earth do we do something like this? Now, this is the problem. And maybe this will be a problem with your research topic that you will pick for the Chemtechathon competition. Because very often, the most lengthy part of any process is sample preparation. So how could Mikhail go into the lab and take a plant and extract chlorophyll from the plant so that he could study it. What's the first step? What would be the second step? What would be the final step? How do we even know that we've got chlorophyll only and nothing else involved when we get to the final step of the process? Well, this is the issue that he faced. So what he did and look at the date, 1901. So not very long ago, 1901, chemistry is fairly new science. Chemical technology is even newer based on the instrumentation that we've got. But 1901 was not that long ago, a little over 100 years. He goes into a lab, and this is his process. So, he takes a plant matter, whatever plant that might be, let's just say spinach, and he takes that into a lab, and he puts it into basically a blender. Yes, we have blenders in the lab, believe it or not. We call them homogenizers not blenders, because we like to make ourselves sound smart when we can. So he puts it into a homogenizer. That sounds a little bit better than a blender. And he just blends it all up. And out of this blender comes just a mush. And he takes this mush and he says, okay, now what am I going to do with it? Okay, I've taken my sample, I've processed it in a way, and I've got this mushy stuff that I then need to turn around and do something with because my chlorophyll is in the mush, and I've got to get my chlorophyll out. So during that time in 1901, 
one of the very common processes that everyone knew about was this thing called filtration, right? And you might have done a filtration already, especially if you've taken some type of science course. It's just a filter, a piece of filter paper that you pour things through, and the filter paper collects all the crud, and all the liquid pours through the filter paper, and you can catch it down below, right? So the common setup with the filtration would be a beaker, and this beaker would have maybe some type of funnel on it, and then you would put your sample here in the top, and then slowly but surely drip, drip, drip into the beaker your solution goes. But Mikhail Tisviet did not want to do just a simple filtration because he was afraid that the chlorophyll would stay behind in the mush and he didn't want that to happen. That was actually one of the problems that he discovered. So a piece of filter paper and a funnel it's not going to cut up for him. So just like with us in our tunnel scenario, Tisviet had to get creative. So what did he end up doing? Well, Tisviet goes into a lab and he gets a piece of glass tubing. So here's my glass tube. And I'm only going to draw a part of it. Down here at the bottom, this glass tube is eventually going to be cut off. So I'm just going to draw it like this. And we're going to have some kind of cutoff valve at the bottom that I can control. And this piece of glass tubing served as his tunnel. And he had to have a flower. Meaning he had to have something that attracted compounds just like our flowers did with the bees. So he needed something cheap, and he needed something that was very common back in the early 1900s. And what he filled his tunnel with, his flower, was calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is CaCO3, a.k.a. chalk. So he takes chalk, he crushes it up to a powder, he takes the calcium carbonate, he puts it into this glass tubing, and then he has this fancier version of a filter. So here's my calcium carbonate, CaCO3. So then he takes the mush and he puts the mush at the top of this piece of glassware on top of the calcium carbonate and then he just keeps adding liquid because he doesn't want it to dry out. The reason is because what he saw in the very beginning is that when he put the sample in, the sample kind of sunk into the calcium carbonate. And then within a matter of minutes this greenish mush began to separate off colors. Green was no longer green, really. As the sample sank into the calcium carbonate, we began and he began to see layers of colors that were separating off. So he might have, depending on the sample, saw a red band or he might would have saw an orange band, or he could have saw a blue band that was coming off from these samples. This is where we term chromatography, color rotting, because when Tisvia did his studies, it was green pigment most of the time, and that pigment was going into the calcium carbonate column or tunnel and it would separate off into colors depending on what he was running he would get different colors hence color rotting just so happen Tisviet also translates into color was it coincidence who knows but Tisviet owns the ballpark in the game 
All right, so we've taken this mush, we've put it into chalk. Tisviet saw that this mush began to separate colors off one by one. These compounds that were the pigments inside of the plant began to go to the calcium carbonate and hang out for different periods of time. And this is what led to the separation. So again, here's Mikhail Tisviet. He was the leader of chromatography and he was really how this whole process began. And he really focused on separating pigments from each other. They could be yellow, they could be green, they could be orange, they could be blue, they could be red, they could be purple eventually. But these compounds were separating from each other. And that was the most important part of the process. Separation. We have taken a complex mixture and we are separating it into individual components. And the only thing that we're doing is adding it to a tunnel that is filled with chalk in 1901. Now, the problem that Tisviet saw was that as the sample dried out, the color separation stopped. So in order for the color separation to travel through the column and out the other end of the tunnel, which is what we're after, he had to keep adding a solvent. He had to keep adding a liquid to the process. As he kept adding liquid, the liquid kept pushing those compounds through the column and out the other end. But you've got to constantly add liquid in order for this process to work. Okay, so here's the limitation. You can already probably see the limitation to this process. The limitation here is that if I do it in a lab and set it up just like Tisviet did in 1901, the limitation is that I'm playing off of color. I have to be able to see it. And if I can't see it, I don't know if it's separating or not. And if I can't see it, then I can't take a beaker down here at the bottom of this column and collect my components as they come off one by one. So that was the problem in the early stages of chromatography. We had to rely on our eyeballs to see what was happening inside of a column like this so that way I could collect my compounds as they came off one by one. Well, no longer do we have to rely on seeing stuff in order to do it. Because now this limitation is no more, what solved this limitation for us was instrumentation. And it's instrumentation like HPLC that will be set up very similar to this, a piece of tubing filled with some kind of solid that a sample will go into and separate one by one and the machine is going to be at the other end of this tunnel and it's going to collect the sample for me and tell me how many of that particular compound is present or in other words concentration. It tells me the concentration of that particular compound that's in my sample. So that's the story with Tisviet. Now what did he see? Is there an actual picture? Well, this is something similar that Tisviet saw. Up here at the very top, you're seeing this crushed up sample that we can blend into a mush. And we can put this mush down into a piece of glass that's filled with calcium carbonate or something similar. And then as the sample travels through the column itself, we start to see the separation layers. We start to see the colors that begin to get pulled off one by one by one.
Now here is an actual schematic of that process as it happens. So here is the tunnel with the flowers on the inside known as a stationary phase and I'll define that a little bit later on in another video. But we introduce our sample up here at the very top. The sample begins to travel through the column or the tunnel and as it travels through this big fancy filtration apparatus what we see is that the sample begins to separate slowly but surely it begins to separate if we have the right tunnel with the right flower on the inside so that's what you're seeing here we start to see a blue and a red and a green and as we keep adding more and more liquid we allow this more and more time to separate and it travels through the column more and more and then eventually we will see big separation that happens and as this green color comes to the bottom we can then put a test tube or a beaker or a cup or something up underneath it to collect that color and then we can set that color over to the side and then as the red travels down to the bottom we can put a new beaker up underneath it and collect the red component and then as the blue or the purple color comes through we can take a new beaker put it up under the bottom collect that particular type of sample and then all of a sudden what we have is maybe a sample set that looks like this we have now collected one component at a time because they've traveled through the column at different rates and we are separating them one from each other so ideally theory wise each one of these sample containers will have hopefully a different bee or wasp in it a different compound on the inside so here we see something that looks a little clear and then we see yellow but not quite and then we see bright yellow and then we see like a green grass color and then maybe a color of green that's not as vibrant or dark and then it goes back yellow again maybe for this process maybe that's the sample that can happen so you can collect them very easily you can collect them without a problem the issue though is being able to see it so in the next video we will pick up from this part we will then continue this discussion of what chromatography is all about and we've got to make sure that we feel comfortable with all of the theory before we talk about the instrument and how it's doing its job so this is it for part two keep in mind more videos to come more videos on your watch list get a bag of popcorn I know that you're excited